Thank you, John. And we're rolling. Great. So you just screened the first two reels of your film. How's it feel? What are your thoughts immediately? Top thoughts? Well, I'm kind of in the twilight zone right now because I've watched the movie 900 times in the last uh, three weeks. But coming into IMAX, putting those first two reels up, you, you don't quite know what you're going to expect. <clears throat> and it's really easy to lose the, uh, the sort of awe in this process because you've just been in the edit bay over and over and over again. And then you, you're watching the movie over and over again and you're watching the effects and everything come together and it's, and it's a job. And so sometimes the awe and the wonder and the majesty sort of get sucked out of it. But just putting up those first two reels on an IMAX screen, all of that joy and wonder and sort of spectacle and awe just comes rushing back because you sit in the theater and you just, it's so in your face that you're like, oh, right, people are going to watch this on a giant screen and they're going <laughs> to forget about all of their problems and all of the, <laughs> everything happening in the world and just get sucked into this experience. So it, it really was amazing putting up those reels and just suddenly being transported back to being a kid watching a movie and being like, oh, right, nothing else matters right now except this right now. From what you just saw, were there <coughs> some particular scenes or shots that were in particular strong in IMAX that you're excited for people to see? I think the whole movie's strong in IMAX. I, IMAX is my preferred version based on what I just saw for people to see this movie. Because it just, it, look, Kong is huge, the movie's big, but there, there, there's something in me, I, I have my own personal philosophy when I go to a theater, I, I hate being too far back because at that point I feel like I'm watching a TV screen. And so for me, I, I want the movie right at the edges of my peripheral vision, like bleeding just past it. And there's something about when you do that in IMAX where you really just lose yourself. And, and so to me, the whole movie, like there's just such sort of scope to the way we shot all of our locations, which were all practical, and going to Vietnam and putting that on a screen and, and, and looking at Kong and these other creatures, that to me, like the whole movie just, it, it sort of gets taken to the next level watching it in IMAX. So you just watched uh, part of it on the <coughs> laser IMAX screen with the 12-channel sound system. Um, what were your thoughts on like the contrast and the brightness, the color gamut, dynamic range of the sound? You know, what, what made it different than seeing it? I mean, everyone comes out now and they're like, oh, we've got a new projector, we've got a new blah, 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 we've got a new sound, and, and to some degree it almost it feels like the arms race that is like men's razors, where they're like, we have 20 blades now, and it's like, does this make a difference? But when you go and you watch the difference between the bulbs, you honestly feel a difference. Like, you, you feel, not only do you feel the, the sort of contrast and the color and, and the dynamic range of everything, but you just get a sense that you couldn't watch this at home. You couldn't go and you couldn't bring it up on your TV or your laptop or your phone. And I think that's one of the biggest problems right now is <clears throat> people would rather stay at home and drink a bottle of wine or a, you know, a six pack of soda and watch something streaming and then go out to the theater. And I think part of that is just because the, this, the, the experience of going to the theater, the, the newness, the awe, the, the, the just, the special quality, like whatever that intangible thing that I used to have when I, would, when I was a kid and you'd go to the theater, you'd be like, oh man, I just went to the theater, it was great. That's gone for so many people now and so I think all of these subtle things, be it the size of IMAX or you know, the, the, the type of projection, like these things do make a difference. I think that they, they f further and further the gap between what people can get at home now and giving them a reason to say, I'm gonna go to the theater, I'm gonna drive in my car, I'm going to go to this thing that doesn't start on demand, doesn't start when I want it to start. I'm going to sit with a bunch of strangers and I want to experience this thing. And so to me, that's just one more layer that helps you sort of immerse yourself in this place. So um, I know this is like your first time here to see something that you've <coughs> made on this screen. You know, when, when uh, we get the footage from the studio from you guys, uh, the artists here, they really go in and frame by frame work on this. Like, what was it like for you to... Um, interact with our team and sort of like know the, the, the things that they do here to sort of like update <coughs> you for yourself. What's that like? It's funny because when you step into a building of uh, a company, sometimes you step in a building and it just is a generic corporation. And then sometimes you go to a place like Pixar or ILM 
or these places that like the the design of the building, the vibe when you walk in, like represents what the company is. And you walk into IMAX and everything is enormous and everything is huge. <clears throat> and it just perfectly sort of reflects the vibe of what IMAX is. And even when you like drive up to the corporate building, it, it, it has the vibe of how a IMAX theater is housed. And, uh, you know, sometimes these things can be really impersonal and you're just going to to check off boxes, to, to say, okay, I looked at that, I did this, uh, that's done now, and you know, everybody at IMAX actually has sort of this this feeling of like, oh, we we want this to be good, and we care about this, and and we we, we take pride in what we're doing, and not just because it's an arms race of like how people make money. Everyone here actually has the vibe. It, it honestly sort of reminds me of like when you walk into Pixar, like the there's there's like an odd creative energy that you, I wouldn't have expected. That's cool, that's, that's really fun to hear. You know, I think we all try to be, right. you know, very into it and, and we're always really excited about <coughs> what we're working on, so. Um, so I, I, when I watched the, I watched 20 minutes of it last night and one of the things that really sort of surprised me was just how deliberate and planned and like well executed the 3D was on this. Like I was, I don't use, it's not something I normally like notice right off the bat, but like, I, I thought it was really impressive. It's probably the first time that you've worked in 3D. Can you talk about what that was like for you? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because we I deliberately didn't shoot the movie in 3D because I like improv, I like being nimble. We were gonna be in the middle of jungles and just the 3D camera rigs were gonna be too cumbersome in there. Um, and for me, I, I, I really want to go see a 3D movie when I feel like it's been designed for that. Like you look at Life of Pi, you look at Avatar, you look at these films that uh, really meaningfully make use of the 3D and, and it's not just a gimmick and it's not just another way to sort of like add $5 to your ticket. But I remember when I was in film school and sort of really diving in and watching all sorts of old classic films, <coughs> I remember watching Dial M for Murder. and. I was so taken by how well framed and choreographed and composed that film is in a way that completely actually plays to a 2D environment where you can absolutely understand how it sort of excels in a 3D format when they were doing, you know, a very rudimentary version of 3D back in the day and <clears throat> Hitchcock was just such a smart guy that he was able to sort of compose it for both formats. You know, when's the last time someone watched Dial M for Murder in 3D? Like, it, it's, it's been decades. But that movie still holds up, and when you watch it, you, you do get the sense of that hand coming at camera or all these things. Just even the way he sort of placed foreground elements that really, I think, took it to the next level. <clears throat> and so when we were constructing the film, like, the, the idea was, okay, we need this to excel in 3D. Like, we needed to, to be warranted that it is 3D, even though we didn't shoot it in 3D. Yeah, I mean, I totally felt it. Like, it totally was, it, it felt very deliberate, like I said. Um, so this is the first film, uh, of your films, that will be shown in the IMAX format. What does that mean to you? How does it feel? When I go to, my favorite theater in LA, period, is Universal City Walk IMAX. Because <clears throat> not only is the screen amazing and the, the sound's great and, and all of that, but it, it's an environment filled with people who genuinely want to go to the theater to have a good time. They want, they want to be entertained. They want to be taken away. They want to have a good night. You know, they want to go out and they want to walk away feeling like, that was great, let's do it again. And, you know, in LA especially, but in a lot of places, like, the theaters don't have that, that energy anymore. They don't have that uh, sense of escapism. They don't have that sense of fun. Uh, it's really easy for people to leave the theater and feel like, well, we could have stayed home and watched, you know, Netflix or whatever. <laughs> and to me, that's sad because, like, when I was a kid, going to the theater was something where it almost didn't matter if the movie you saw was good. You're like, oh, I went to the theater, great, you know. And you'd walk away from that, and you were you were psyched, and 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 there's there was just something so magical about that process. And for me, like, the theater is my church. <coughs> And I love being in a dark space. I, I love it when I'm in a theater alone. I love it when I'm in a theater full of people. Like, I love that experience. And IMAX to me is the, the pinnacle of that. Like, you know, for me, I want the frame bleeding past my peripheral vision. And there's nothing like that as when you're in IMAX. Because, like, I, I like when 
when you're reading text and your eyes have to actually track from there to there, like you, know, you actually have to sort of move because you can't get that at home unless you're sitting an inch from the screen. And so, you know, it, it's so easy to get caught up in the process when you're making something like this. And IMAX just becomes another thing that you have to check off the box of like, I gotta go look at 3D, I gotta go look at these visual effects, I gotta go look at this Dolby version, I gotta go look at blah, 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 blah. And there's 900,000 different things you gotta do, but actually going in and being able to see on your poster or having like an IMAX exclusive poster that says, see it in IMAX. And there's just something so legit about that. There's something so real about that. It's like, it's, oh, we didn't make this small movie. Like we made something to be seen on a big, a big ass screen. Um, how did you get tapped for this in the first place? Can you tell us a little bit about the process of, of, of coming on board this project? Um, I, let's see. <laughs> um, I had made, I'd been out in LA for a while making shorts. No one wanted to pay attention to me. No one wanted to give me work. Um, making web stuff. No one wanted to hire me for commercials. And it was just one of those dumb, like all the time people go, oh, how, how did, how did this happen? What did you do? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Los Angeles is just such a, like, a unexplainable, weird thing where I, I'd been making shorts and some of those started to go to Sundance and um, uh, a TV show that I created got picked up by Comedy Central and that sort of spiraled. But then still no one wanted to give me a movie. No one wanted to say, hey, we trust you with our film. Um, and then I got linked up with these amazing guys, um, uh, this company, Big Beach, that made Little Miss Sunshine, and they brought me this script. It was called Toys House at the time, uh, which was later became Kings of Summer, and they sent me this script, and my first reaction to it was honestly, great, but why are you sending me a script that clearly someone's attached to? Like, I was so in love with the script, but I, I honestly got mad at my agents and managers. for doing it. <laughs> like, Why are you sending me a script that clearly has a director? How could the script not have a director? I was just so taken with it. The writing was just so uh, lovely. And made that film, <laughs> honestly thought people were gonna hate it, um, was fully prepared to go to Sundance with it and uh, have people hate it and then go bury myself in the snow uh, and never return. Um, and it came out and, you know, it, it did fine, uh, but I just, I love movies and I, I just started talking to people about how Making an indie was great, but when you make an indie, it almost doesn't matter how good it is because it's almost impossible for people to see it. If you make an indie film, unless you catch the zeitgeist, it's near impossible for the average world to break through the noise barrier and, know, like, and to separate it from all of the big movies and all the big pop stars and all the politics and all the sports. It's impossible to break through that noise for. And so, you know, for me, I just, I, I, I come from a place where I love film history and I love foreign cinema and I love classic cinema. But before I fell down the rabbit hole of like importing movies and going to specialty video stores and riding my bike to the video store every day, before I knew about art cinema, before I knew about foreign cinema, I grew up on studio films. And they were big and they were bold and they showed you worlds that you hadn't been to before and they had characters that you just took with you for the rest of time. And, and there wasn't like a stigma associated with it. It wasn't like, oh, it's another studio thing. Those movies were big and they were great. And, and, and they weren't mutually exclusive. And so I grew up on studio stuff uh, and I wanted to make something after having made an indie to, to sort of break through that noise floor to be able to sort of have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people hopefully fall in love with something because the greatest joy as a filmmaker for me at least is the, the moment when something goes from being this thing that I made to suddenly like this isn't my movie anymore this is your movie you know and, and watching people sort of take that on and, and watching the way that stuff impacts people or talking to people that they say oh well, like that was my favorite movie when I was a kid or that was like that's the stuff that's that's incredible and so um, <coughs> Legendary had a script uh, and an idea for King Kong. I'd let it be known that I really wanted to do a big movie and was uh, talking to a lot of people, but nothing had really sort of stuck out. Nothing had jumped out to say. Like for me, my barometer is like, do I need to do this? This really, like, do I need to do this thing? And I got a call on a Sunday about uh, 
this King Kong movie? And honestly, my first response was, no thanks. Like, why? Why, why do we need another King Kong movie? Why tell this story? Why, why do we need this? And to Legendary and Warner Brothers credit, <coughs> they sort of said, okay, well, what, what version would you make? And I honestly didn't have an answer to that. And they're like, well, go away for the weekend. Think about it. And I came back to them and said, here's the crazy version of this movie that I would make. Here's what I would want to see. Here's what I think my friends would want to see, which is what sort of led me to pitch in them this idea of like 1970s in the shadow of Vietnam, uh, choppers and napalm and Kong and Apocalypse Now and, you know, Platoon mixed with monsters. And um, the cool thing about Legendary and Warner Brothers is they, I honestly thought they were going to laugh me out of the room. And instead they were like, cool, let's do that. And then it was this moment of, <laughs> oh crap, how do, how do we do this now? So that's how I got here. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a big transition. It's a big change from going to what you were doing to working on a movie as big as Kong. Can you talk about like the learning curve on that <coughs> and uh, the challenges, that, or the biggest challenges for you in, in sort of shifting gears into that kind of movie making? Uh, filmmaking is filmmaking. So, like, if you learn to drive an automobile, you could probably get into a tractor and figure out how to drive it. You could, pr you could get into a race car and you could drive it. That doesn't mean you wouldn't crash it, but you can still get in it. But, like, the mechanics of driving a car or riding a bike are the same things. So, whether it's an indie or a commercial or a TV show or a giant monkey movie, uh, the mechanics are the same, and it's just then about like navigating how this specific vehicle kind of works. Um, and there's a lot of things that I, I, I could never have prepared myself for, and there's a lot of things that um, uh, were amazing about having that many resources. And then there's tons of things where you almost long for the days where you didn't have those resources, so you could keep it small and and you know sort of intimate. And they're just different formats in a weird way like they, they're both filmmaking but they're different types and uh, it it was a hell of a transition um, and it, to, to me like I just thrive off of seeing the way different things get made and so sort of understanding how to best like utilize how you are the best version of yourself in um, a process like that it's like it's like a, a basketball player like Kobe Bryant wasn't the same player for as long as his entire career. Every time he got injured, every time he got to a certain age, every time, you know, he sort of, he became something else. And like the best sports players are the guys who like, as they go from team to team, they, they are, they're able to tap into their, a different part of themselves and they fulfill a different role and they become a different player. And so that's kind of how I view um, making a movie like this. Uh, where you're tapping into different parts of yourself and, and you have to understand that you're, you're part of something so big and there's so many moving pieces. And so you just, you know, like I, I come from an indie world where I love to be able to just grab a camera and run and we tried as much as possible to really facilitate a world on set with my actors, uh, just in general, where we could still do that, where we could say, oh, here's this crazy moment, we can grab this and we can, we can do this. And I tried to create an environment where I could bring a lot of those indie sensibilities to this and and there's a lot of stuff in this movie a lot of um a lot of shots a lot of scenes a lot of john c Riley stuff where it's just us riffing and having fun and finding moments like i i for me filmmaking is about finding moments and then being able to capture it and so a big part of it was saying this is a totally different way to make a movie than what i'm used to so how do we make a movie in that world but then bring myself to it and how can i get myself in there because i think people's number one complaints in movies like this is that they feel like they don't have a voice. And sometimes these big movies feel like they, um, they, they're, there isn't a director behind it, there's a, there's a traffic cop. Uh, or you walk out of these big movies and it's just like, great, that was, a, that was fun, but like, who made that? You know, whereas like, I think the movies that resonate most with people throughout time like have an intense voice to them. Um, and so it really was figuring out how to sort of interject a voice in something this big. Yeah, and not only something this big, but something that has such a long history, too, right? It's been around since at least in the film forum, like 1933. You know, what, what was it like to sort of take all those iterations and use that, you know, to your advantage to make a movie like this? Like, how, how 
does it resonate with those old things, but also like, you know, how do you, how did you change it or like bring yourself into it? What do you think about this movie? Well, a big part of this movie was, was justifying its existence from the beginning saying, why do we need another King Kong movie? Why does, why should this movie exist? <coughs> And so the movie is sort of a, a, a genre mashup and a Kong mashup of <coughs> all the different things that have come before. But fundamentally, the, the most important thing that we were trying to do was every Kong movie, for the most part, has been a remake of the same story. It's been a remake of the 1933 version, which is, a, which is the Beauty and the Beast story. And fundamentally, I set out to tell a new story within that mythology. I wanted to take the character, take some of the fundamentals of the world, take these sort of like the canon pillars that sort of built the universe and twist them and remix them and play with them, but then fundamentally tell a different kind of story within that universe, not do the Beauty and the Beast thing, do something different and give it a reason for being. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of remixing and, and mashing up of, of Kong lore and different uh, elements of all of the movies that have come before it. Um, and so I we very much, and th there's a lot of stuff that I don't think people will, will pick up on besides super fans where there's a lot of sort of subtle homages and, um, and callbacks and things like that to the, the lore that came before it. But, you know, we wanted to try and innovate and not just for innovation's sake, not to be new for the sake of being new, but to actually have that fundamentally impact the type of story we were telling and to show audiences something new because I feel like fundamentally the number one reason cinema is hurting right now is because audiences don't feel like they're being shown new things. Audiences sit in a theater now and they watch a trailer for something and they watch something and they say, that looks cool, but I feel like I've seen that. Even if they haven't seen it. And so, <laughs> you know, rightfully so, like I can sit here and honestly tell you that most people's reaction to our movie initially was, why do we need another King Kong movie? And then as soon as we dropped the trailer at Comic-Con and no one knew about the sort of apocalypse now of it all and the 70s of it all, that, that stuff hadn't really leaked. But as soon as we dropped it, universally everyone was like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, I understand why this movie exists. And, you know, it just was trying to sort of take a character that people loved and a, and a sort of rough uh, outline that people loved and then really do something new. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I picked up on last night, like thematically speaking, was sort of the exploitation of the environment and sort of disrupting nature, you know, and I, I feel like what I saw like had a lot to do with those kinds of themes, you know, which may or may not have been sort of what the original films or the past iterations have been about. How do you think those themes have sort of changed over time? And well, I, I think it taps into a lot of the, you know, Kong as a character is just fundamentally, <clears throat> I think the reason he's re resonated throughout time is that every single person, every person in this room, every person watching this video, every person on the planet, in some way, is misunderstood. And fundamentally, we as humans forget that about other people. We look at other people and we want to judge them and we want to say something about them and we want to assume something about them and we're forgetting that very core fact of like, oh, that person doesn't like the way they're being perceived, regardless of who, how they come across and who they are. And so I think the misunderstood nature of Kong has resonated for that very reason because I think that's just such a core part of the human condition. And um, thematically, yeah, there's a lot about sort of man and nature in the film, but there's also a lot about sort of uh, the way we deal with myth and, and the fact that it's okay to not know or that it's okay to... Um, for something to be bigger than us or greater than us. And I think that just people have forgotten. Look, we live in a time in which you could go on your cell phone and you could, and I've said this a bunch, but like you could go on your cell phone and you could fundamentally Google, does Santa Claus exist? At that point, you're a six-year-old kid and you've looked up whether Santa Claus exists and there's no myth anymore. There's no, there's no uncertainty. There's no question mark to the world. Whereas when we were kids and growing up, if someone said something to you, you didn't know if it was real unless you knew an expert or you read a book. And so there was all these ideas of what could happen out there. Like you look, like the reason that the, the Malaysian Airlines flight was such a story to people beyond it being like a terrible tragedy was we live in a world in which people don't think things like that can happen. A plane can't just go missing. How can a plane go missing? It's 2017. But then it does. And people are reminded of the fact that like we don't know everything. We don't know a lot about ourselves and the world and our place in the universe 
And so thematically, you know, we just really wanted to sort of tap into the sense of things being, the sense of the unknown and, and being okay with the unknown. And, and knowing that you sort of don't belong in a certain place. And like, I'm, I'm also just obsessed with the fact that like, one of the greatest things that we as humans has, have done is remove ourselves from the food chain. We used to get eaten by shit all the time. And now we don't. And that's a big deal. And we all go about our lives and we act like, oh, everything's fine, ha ha, I got this new app on my phone. Meanwhile, we used to get killed every day in the streets by tigers <laughs> and all sorts of things. And, and we've forgotten that. And we, like, we just kind of brushed past that in human history. Like, ha, 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 look at, look at what we're doing now. We built this uh, cool factory. And so the movie was about sort of what happens when you're confronted with myth. What happens when you're confronted with things that are larger than you, things that you can only sort of perceive to be a god or something greater. And what happens when you're put back in the food chain? What happens to you as a human who's built up these rules of the universe and the way the world works and, and what our role as a man and as a human, where we belong and we are gods of our domain and this is our world. So what happens when you're confronted with that? What happens when you're confronted with something greater than you and something primordial and something that shouldn't exist? And what happens when you are put back in the food chain? And what happens when you, you, you stare at this thing that's enormous and the only way that you can comprehend it is to say that's a god that's something greater than me who who does that make who does that drive you crazy do you become the the atheist the agnostic the believer do you like where where do you fall on that like what does that do to you on a human level and so you know those were sort of a lot of the, the themes and ideas that we were playing with and yeah some of those come from the original film but then uh, a lot of those are really just trying to sort of present people new ideas. So you think about it. When I leave a theater, my favorite thing is when it's two weeks later and I'm still thinking about something from a movie. That's what movies exist for me. Yeah, that moment, just speaking about those moments when you're confronted with like, the confrontation, that moment with uh, Samuel Jackson, like when he first oh, right. staring deep into like his face, it's, it's pretty powerful. And I think like to see him sort of being humbled right. is, is kind of fun to watch. Yeah, it's just who... How do you react when you're when you're put in an extreme situation? What comes out? Yeah. You know, just and I think that's just a, a fundamental human thing. And just speaking about casting for a moment, can you talk a little bit about the process of that? I mean, you guys have such like a dynamic cast of people who all bring very different sort of sensibilities to the screen. I'm sure into the production as well. Yeah, I'm, look, I, I'm super fortunate to have an incredible cast that. Uh, our friends and family at this point and um, you know it was important to me to also send a message for this movie of like hey there are there are actors on screen people who could be doing Shakespeare in the park you know and they all bring very different things to it um, but but you need people with that credibility who a have that type of like old-school charisma that sort of leaps off of screen but you also need people with credibility so that for me, a big part of the movie and a big part of the pitch to, to these guys was like, I want to be able to linger on your face. I just want a shot, like a macro close-up of your eyes. And I want that to be able to almost be more important than the, the CG creature, than the, the, than the action happening around it. Like, I want those human moments. I want those visceral moments. And, and you know, with each of them sort of pitched them on this sort of, this, this idea in the 70s and the thematic relevance and, uh, of, of why it was there, and then to be able to actually bring them on set and say, look, when we make this movie, I don't want it to be a regimented, we do this shot and then this shot, and we do this shot. Like, I come from Indies, and so I wanted it to be uh, loose where we could play around and we could find things and we could explore and find moments. And so with a lot of the actors, you know, even before they were hired, it was sort of saying, like, come and do this movie, but I want to let you know if you do it, like, when you think you're sitting down for a break like, and they're setting up a shot, we might just grab a camera and we might abscond away behind where everyone else is shooting and, and find something. And, and that stuff's all in the movie and I think, it, I think it comes across. And you know, a big part of that is you know, a credit to my incredible cast who I think just sell the hell out of these moments and, and really sort of uh, uh, ground you in a very ungrounded situation. Um, and I just can't speak highly enough about that. Sounds like they really brought their game. To the table. Yeah, I mean, when people are gonna, people are gonna lose their minds about John C. Riley in this movie. 
he, he, yeah, but even from the trailers, like, he is next level in the film. And, like, Jason Mitchell and Corey Hawkins and people like John Ortiz and Shea Wiggum, who are these amazing character actors that people have seen over and over again but wouldn't necessarily know by name, are just, just bring it so hard. And then you have, like, Hiddleston and Bree and so many incredible people who uh, just absolutely ooze that sort of old school charisma. Um, John C. Riley, I see him pretty often because he likes to roller skate. Oh yeah, yeah, he goes, Brazil, yeah, he goes. Like every, yeah. every Wednesday. Yeah, no, he's, he's there. oh, he's there. He's the character. Like, <laughs> he's, uh, it's so funny to like just skate alongside of him and just be like, yo, hey, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, he's he's about he's more active than I am. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's more tapped into cool shit than me. So just sort of like on a bigger scale, what what is it like for you to sort of take on this <coughs> iconic, you know, um, property? Like, what did that mean to you? Like, sort of just for you personally? Kong is film history. Kong is an icon. You don't want to be the guy that made the crappy Kong movie. <laughs> you know, he is, he represents so much in film and pop culture, like, you know, the, the, the origin of so many special effects and what begat, like, Harryhausen and, and th these films that then begat Star Wars and, and that begat what modern cinema is, like, it, it, you're literally playing with film history. As a kid, I had never seen King Kong. Why, why am I going to watch a, a black and white movie from 1933 as a kid when you're, like, a young kid? But I knew who King Kong was. And my dad had bought um, like a 12-inch King Kong like action figure from a garage sale one day, and he brought it home. And I just used to stare at it. He used to like sit on top of my dresser. And King Kong's the type of character, much like Godzilla, and a lot of these like real sort of classic characters that you just you you run with stories in your head. There, there's there's so much. There's just so much, sort of built into the collective unconscious about these characters and what they represent and who they are and the journeys that they've been on. And to me, it was just the perfect sort of beacon as a kid to stare at, like, this movie monster. And so you don't, you don't take that lightly. You know, you don't... You're playing with an icon. You're playing with one of the most, like, seminal and important things in film. And that 1933 movie is still incredible. There's effects in that movie that, like, you can't believe they were doing back then. And so you don't take that lightly, but then also you have to go in and say, okay, there's a lot of reverence for this, and we need to treat this with respect, but we also need to shake things up, and we need to, like, reinvent, and we need to elevate beyond expectations, you know, just with everything. How do you take the, the, the imagery and the ideas of the wall and the villagers and the island and you know, all of these different things, and, and how, do you, how do you elevate beyond expectation? How do you give people something that feels fresh, but not fresh for fresh sake, that actually fundamentally sort of impacts the movie you're watching and pays homage to what came before it? Like, it's a really tricky, delicate balance, and I guess I'll leave that to the audience to decide whether we pulled it off. What do you hope that you're bringing to the to this property that's unique and different and original? <coughs> um, I think that, uh, <coughs> I think a lot of people walked out of my last movie, King of Summer, and h had this sort of um, feeling of it being a throwback and modern at the same time. And I think that, you know, this is a 1970s Vietnam War film that also feels very modern at the same time. And yet it also has throwback elements to sort of a, <coughs> Uh, a creature feature and and the like classic 1930s cinema and so I, I would hope that we've created a genre mashup that um, feels classic and contemporary at the same time I think that we have created a version of Kong that stays true to who he is but <coughs> is a very different literal beast uh, and figurative beast I think that um, for me, as someone who grew up on video games and anime and things like that, I think that there's like a very sort of subtly stylized element to the way that he moves, the way that he behaves. And to me, I wanted to create a Kong who was like any other Kong before him, where he's more of this lonely god. He's a lumbering god. He's a, he's a morose god. And there's a sadness to him, and there's a loneliness to him. And, you know, I think that we 
created a new version of that and while creating like a genre mashup that I don't think has existed. Like, what name me another like 1970s uh, Vietnam War film filled with giant monsters. Like, or name me another giant monster film with music set to, you know, Credence. Like, th that you, you can't. <coughs> and a big part of the movie for me was like, I, I feel like most action set pieces are redundant. I feel like you could cut one action set piece out of one movie and completely cut it into another movie and you'd almost never know. Cut one car chase from this, put it in that. Every single action scene in our movie can only exist in our movie. Like, just based on, like, I, I, there's no other movie where you're gonna see like a fleet of helicopters take down a giant monkey or like a, a, a Vietnam War battle sequence set in the midst of like a giant ancient boneyard or, you know, there, there's so many weird things that w we just really tried to be like, well, this can only exist in this film. And I think that also for me, the, I mean, the biggest thing for me um, is also the tone. Like, I, I think that a lot of movies have forgotten how to play with tone. Um, and a lot of these big movies want to say, like, well, you can be one tone, you can be one thing. And I think when people watch, people are going to be surprised when they watch this movie. Not because, because they'll, they'll, they'll people, will be, people will be surprised when they watch this movie because they'll jump and they'll react and be scared. And so you'll have, like, that visceral, oh, shit. But then they're also gonna laugh and I think that they're gonna be surprised at how much they feel for Kong and how much they feel for John C. Riley in particular and, and the heart and the human heart that he brings to it and the levity. People are going to laugh in this film and they're gonna be surprised they're laughing and they're gonna be laughing at stuff that I think they're normally gonna say, wait a second, you can't put those things together. And I think you can put them together. And I, so I think stylistically, tonally, uh, I just think we've made a very different film. <laughs> yeah, you haven't you haven't gotten to John C. Riley. No, not at all. Um, so this con is bigger than any con that we've seen in the past, right? Can you? How big is that exactly? Unless you want like product placement. <laughs> <coughs> and like, what went into <coughs> the creature design? The creature <coughs> like? Well, with all of the creatures and with Kong, <coughs> you're playing with an icon, so you're playing with film history, so. <coughs> you need to create something that people can look at and be like, that's the Kong from that movie. And have him feel classic and true to his design. And if anything, we went sort of back to that original 1933 design. Like one of the first things when I came in was saying, <coughs> he should be bipedal, like the, like the 33 Kong. He should walk on two feet. Um, and he's not just a big ape. He's not just a big silverback gorilla. He is a monster. He is a movie monster. And with all of the creatures, we had thousands of creature designs. <clears throat> and they didn't make it in the movie unless it felt like I had never seen that before. And all of the creatures have a, the sort of mandate for me was a very sort of uh, Miyazaki uh, inspired thing where I wanted all of the creatures to have a sort of like spirituality to them. I wanted the island to have a cross section of being the most beautiful thing you've ever seen and yet you look at these creatures or this place and you, you don't know whether this is the best moment of your life or you're going to die or you're going to pee yourself. You know, like you just don't know what that cross section is. And so it was, um, it was really, it was a long process to create creatures that had that spirituality. If Kong is the god of this island, then, <coughs> then all the other creatures are sort of the gods of their individual domain and they look after them. And, and there is a, uh, a mysticism and a, um, a spirituality and a power associated with them. And that was really important to me. Um, and, you know, Kong's 100 feet tall. And he's 100 feet tall because, uh, I don't know if you'll use this part in the video, but everyone, everyone online wants to say, like, <clears throat> oh, they only made Kong big so he can fight Godzilla. Which obviously is a franchise thing down the road, but that's way above my pay grade. <coughs> And to me, I wanted to make Kong that big because I wanted people, I wanted to say, how big does this thing need to be? Where if you stand here and you look up at him and he towers over you, how big does that creature need to be for you to fundamentally not just say, oh, that's a big creature. Oh, or that, that thing's crazy. That's, that's a giant version of that. That's a big monkey. Versus saying, that's a god. I'm looking at a god. I'm staring at this thing. So how big do you have to make that? For, the, for you to just be tower, for something to tower over you and to just cast a shadow upon you. 
where you as a human feel dwarfed and insignificant in its presence. And so that's why Kong's 100 feet tall, because he needed to dwarf you and make you feel completely insignificant in a world in which humans feel that they are the most significant. Yeah, it, it, it helps too to have sort of like that moment in the beginning of the film where they fly through that hurricane. It's like you're right. entering a different right. realm, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I like that. It's a, and now that you mentioned Miyazaki, like my mind is going crazy right now just thinking about like those creatures and like Princess Mononoke, like, you know, where they're, it's a similar story, right? Where you're sort of invading. Yeah, the movie is very Mononoke. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for like the film questions. I just have a couple of like more IMAX related questions. Do you remember the first IMAX film that you saw? I'm an old man, so w like they didn't show cool movies in IMAX when I was a kid. Like IMAX was like <coughs> when I was a kid. <coughs> I, I grew up in Detroit, and so uh, there was a place um, called Greenfield Village, which was like a part of like this Henry Ford Center, <coughs> which was like kind of this like old dusty museum and. And you would go there and then you would watch like an IMAX documentary about snails or cars, <laughs> you know, and uh, or it was, it was all science stuff, you know, and it was cool and it was cool to see a movie in IMAX <coughs> and it was cool to see this big stuff and occasionally they would cut to nature stuff or footage of the stars or whatever that you were like, wow, that's really amazing. But to me, the, the shift in the cultural relevancy of IMAX from just going from showing sort of documentaries made in that format to taking, like there's, there's a reason IMAX is relevant right now and that's because it's, more, it's a more potent experience than going to a regular movie theater. Because you can have a big TV at your house now, you can have a projector at your house now, you can have all this giant stuff. And so IMAX suddenly almost is what a regular screen used to be, where it has to be that much bigger for you to feel like, well, I can't do this at home, you know, and, and so, I don't remember the exact IMAX movie that I watched when I was a kid, but it definitely was some like <coughs> nerdy documentary type thing that you go and you're like, cool, great. But as soon as they started showing and, and filmmakers started shooting segments in IMAX and, and really like taking advantage of that format, like it, it, it completely sort of changed, I mean, from my outside perspective, the, the brand of IMAX, the identity of IMAX, the, what the name IMAX meant. You know, I'd say what IMAX meant when I was a kid versus now is a 100% different thing. Yeah, I mean, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary. So IMAX has been around for quite a while. And like you said, for a long time, it was really just those documentary films. But up until the last like 15 years, you know, we started really diving into Hollywood movies. What, how do you think IMAX has changed like the cinema experience, how, I mean, you kind of <coughs> answered it already, but you know, like for an audience member, what does it mean to them, you know, to see a movie like that? I think IMAX has changed the film experience because, uh, I mean, th there's no greater example than like the, the, the sequences in um, Ghost Protocol or in The Dark Knight and, and the feeling that you get when you viscerally feel transition from 35 millimeter into IMAX and the scope changes and the resolution changes, the detail changes and you feel it, like you feel something in your core, something happens where you just feel like poof, you've been transported, like you're in a different place. And I think it really was the, the genius of you know, guys like Nolan going out there and saying, we need to give audiences something new. We need to give them a reason to be in a theater. We need to give them a reason to say, I can't just do this at home. And so, you know, just showing a movie in IMAX is one thing, like taking the film, blowing it up, that's its own thing, and that's great. And, <coughs> and there's great value to that. But when, when like real filmmakers go and they shoot sequences in that format n and knowing how to use the format, it's the same thing with 3D. Like you look at a 3D ver movie versus you look at Life of Pi, with someone who like really was saying, I'm gonna push a format. And you look at what Nolan and these guys are doing with IMAX and the way that they push the format and the way that they'll frame things and know like, you know what, when you look at the monitor here, this looks really tiny, but this is gonna be on this massive screen. And like framing and composing and designing for IMAX, I think really just changed the game. I think it, I think it fundamentally justified for an entire generation, like why go, see, why you should go see a movie in IMAX.
the uh, if you could watch any film or remaster any film that already exists, maybe you know, from any era of filmmaking, what would you want to see in IMAX? Um, if I could remaster any film in IMAX, I might be super basic and say. Two thousand and one, or Lawrence of Arabia, or these movies that already look amazing when you see them big. But I, I kind of selfishly just say that so that it would be more accessible, so that you could like go on a Friday and see two thousand and one, or see uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Like there, are <coughs> there are shots in Lawrence of Arabia that, uh, like that, just no one would do now, because the the person's this small on a screen, and and like. <coughs> Even for myself, making this this big movie, which is huge, and I think there's a hu like, an incredible like wave that rushes over you when you watch a movie like this in IMAX. But there were there were times when we, when we were framing things where you have to think to yourself, well, most people are going to watch this on their phone, or most people are going to watch this on a plane. And so, the, as a filmmaker, you feel you feel constrained because you want to make the person this tiny in the frame, but you can't. Or you feel like you shouldn't because <coughs> of how people consume their content now. Whereas you go to an IMAX screen, or you watch Lawrence of Arabia, you watch these movies, and the 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 fortitude and the adeptness to which he shot that film and framed that film and wasn't afraid to make things small, to make people small, to like hold on a frame and not even realize that there's a guy waving in the distance, like it's just, it's incredible. So I'd maybe do something like that, or um, uh, maybe like an old John Ford Western, just something that like just has all that old embedded sort of scope in it. Honestly, you could almost take in Kurosawa's entire catalog and I'd be curious to see a movie like that on, on IMAX. Cool. Mm -hmm. Debbie, what do you think? Do, you, do did we cover everything? Yeah, <clears throat> although I would love to know what you're working on next, <laughs> and if you would consider using like IMAX cameras, or even if you don't, <coughs> like protecting the aspect ratio and seeing if you can expand that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know you were just talking about that. If right? you guys want to give me an IMAX camera to go shoot something, I'll go shoot something. Right on. <laughs> um, <coughs> let me let me take an IMAX movie and I'll, or camera and I'll go make a Sundance short. <laughs> uh, the next thing I'm doing, I'm gonna sleep for approximately a year. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go into hibernation. I'm going to remember what it is to get my life back. And I'm, the next thing I'm doing is hopefully watching people react and fall in love with this film and, and have it mean something to them uh, and feel like they, they had a good time at the movies where they went and like I just, <coughs> I'm so excited like opening weekend for just like packed audiences to see them like laugh and jump and, and gasp together. Um, so I'm doing that and then uh, I don't know what I'm doing next. I'm probably going to go do a, uh, I want to just go do something very like experimental and make like a, uh, another like very small movie and then come back to, to another, like a big movie. But I want to just go and um, experiment and play and like kind of have like a very, very small like skeleton crew and like go out to the, the jungle or somewhere and just make like a very intimate small thing. Um, and I absolutely would shoot with IMAX. Um, my big things are <coughs> how cumbersome the cameras are, <coughs> which with the Alexa 65 now, it's a much more reasonable thing. Um, you know, and for me, another thing is like, I have no allegiance to film necessarily. I love film, <coughs> but a big part of my process as a director is um, really long takes and really just like getting in there with the actors and working and playing and taking that back and doing this and doing that. And so film is not necessarily conducive to that, but with the Alexa now, you can sort of have an IMAX image and have it be digital and have it not be this massive thing. <coughs> so as soon as IMAX is ready to give me a camera to go and play, I will go and shoot many things with it. Great. So. Um, I have one other question too. How, how long did you know that IMAX was going to be a part of this release? So in other words, when you were shooting, <coughs> did you know? Were you framing IMAX? Did you know then? Or? <coughs> well, we never changed the aspect ratio. Um, you know, we... Initially, when we started shooting the movie, my intent was to shoot um, 
actual segments in IMAX and to, to play with the aspect ratio. But then all of the stuff that I would have wanted to shoot that way was in Vietnam, which you know we were the first movie ever, essentially, uh, to shoot in Vietnam. Uh, there have been a lot of movies about Vietnam, but they've all been shot other places. And so any other movie that's shot there is like a very sort of small indie, essentially, or Vietnamese productions or some foreign the productions I've shot there, but nowhere near this scale. And so we were sort of breaking new ground by going to Vietnam, which is the most gorgeous, incredible, wonderful place in the world. And, um, and it just became too difficult to sort of also take the, all the IMAX gear there and do that for us. But I would have loved to. So, cool. Next time. Next time. <laughs> Next time. Cool. I think we're good to go. All righty.